Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar, Scaling with Control and Compliance. This is our second in our series on Viva Vault Quality Docs. My name is Amy Leung and I'm the Marketing Associate at Viva. I'll be the host today. And just a few points before we get started, we'll be having a three to five minute Q&A at the end of the demo. So if there's time, we'll be answering some questions. And if you have any question at any point during the demo, please use the question section of your GoToWebinar panel to submit it. We'll be monitoring these questions as they come in and answering them at the end. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff Strand. He's a sales engineer R&D. Are you ready, Jeff? I am. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, uh, wherever you are in the world. And thank you for attending our webinar today. Uh, as Amy mentioned, this is the second of a series. Uh, you can see the uh, this one is there, along with the uh, remaining three. I put a hyperlink there if anyone wants to uh, register for any upcoming webinars. If any of these subjects uh, interest you, they will all be centered around quality docs. And um, hopefully uh, you'll uh, appreciate uh, the effort we put into these and in doing these um, on those dates. What I wanted to start with here was just a brief refresher in terms of what is Vault. Vault is a regulated content management application built specifically for the life sciences and deployed out in the cloud. What that means simply is that what we at Viva have done is built Vault from the ground up. And that orange bar that you see on the bottom there, that is the Vault platform. So basically you can think of that as the content management platform. That is everything that you would expect from a compliance and a productivity perspective. For example, version control, life cycles, document types, workflows, everything that you would need to manage content. In addition to that, what we have designed it specifically for the life sciences industry. And so we are managing all of the regulated capacity in that content management application as well. So things like e-signatures, audit trails, the security model, et cetera. So once we have this foundation in place with the Vault platform on top here, what we have are these applications. These are addressed um, as specific areas in the business that range from the commercial side of the business, which is what you see there with promotional materials and medical communications, for example, into drug development, which we handle in submissions, as you can see here, and our clinical operations area, which are handled by ETMF and Investigator Portal. And ultimately, what we have here is Vault Quality Docs, which is the focus of today. Each of these application areas are really twofold. On one hand, they are, have a pre-designed configuration to address content in that specific area of the business. So think things like document types, workflows, life cycles that are built specifically for this type of content. And so in Quality Docs, for example, what we'll see today, it would be things like a GXP life cycle. Also, there are specific function functionality in the application uh, for this part of the business. So once again, what we're going to see today around Quality Docs, things like controlled copy, periodic review, et cetera. A few of the things that you'll see immediately as I begin to go through the presentation today and probably what you saw when Eric did his presentation on April 8th around accelerating the quality process, it was the first part of our webinar series, is really the accessibility of Vault. It's easy to get to. Vault is a zero footprint application and all that's needed is an internet connection and an internet browser. So what that means if you think about it is that we can be on any device, unlike previous generations of systems where I had to be on a specific you know, device and operating system and so on and so forth. I can be on a PC historically like we've been with previous generations of systems like I am today, but I also could be on a Mac, I could be on an iPad, I could be on a mobile device, anything that has an internet connection, an internet browser, and I'm good to go. Furthermore, we can be browser agnostic. So I'm on, I'll be using Google Chrome today, but I could be on IE, Safari, Firefox, so on and so forth. The other item you'll see is around this consumer web design that's here. What's nice about that is really it helps with the ease of use in terms of being able to use Vault, find what you want, 
and drive processes in ways that are meaningful to your organization. What we tried to do really here was rather than rep replicate previous generations of systems where a lot of times it was arduous at best to go into the system to be able to assign things, find things, search, filter, so on and so forth. Rather than replicate that, we kind of took a step back and said, why don't we look at the consumer web and something like an Amazon.com, for example, where you know they have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of products. And leverage what they do there. You can put in a search, a couple filters, and find what you want, and really do all that with no training whatsoever. So let's try to bring that type of model into content management. And hopefully you'll see that as I go through that today. Finally, what we have here is really this is all delivered via multi-tenant cloud. What that means is that we handle everything at Viva from providing the application to providing the infrastructure to managing the upgrades to backup and disaster recovery if God forbid that's ever needed. And it's all included in the subscription. And so what we do at the end of the day really is relieve our clients from having to be concerned with the operational management of this and really focus on their core business. Just jumping into this, uh, what we're going to focus on today, this is around scaling with control and compliance. And hopefully what you'll see really is the whole aspect of the quality operation that we can handle through the entire GXP process and how you can also get information out to your user base. So, you know, we're going to kind of finish up the GXP process that Eric had started on April 8th when he went through and showed you how you could create content, send things out for review and do annotations, get some kind of approval. I'm kind of going to pick it up from the QA approval part show the way the periodic review can happen, show the way that uh, controlled printing could perhaps take place, or controlled copy could take place, and then also the way that change control, if I ever wanted to uh, make this a higher version uh, in the future, how that would take place in a compliant manner. And so with that, I'm going to go into the quality docs demonstration here. Before I do that, let's, uh, let's assume that I'm going to play the role of a fictitious guy, Ken Quality, it will be my name. Picture me as a, someone who's in quality assurance, and so I have higher level rights into this uh, application. Of course, what you're using is Quality Docs today. And so let's say that one day, you know, I come into my email box. I happen to have like a catch-all email box here that catches everything, uh, various demos that I do. But let's imagine that I see this one that catches my eye in the top here. It talks about I need to assess the approval outcome for calibration SOP. If I dive into this, notice how Vault has sent me an email. It's got some information in here. This is configurable, by the way. This is the look and feel, and even the nomenclature in here could um, be modified. But notice how it has a link here for me. If I click on this link, what's going to happen is that I've been told in that email message that I need to do the QA approval. So this has been drafted. It's been sent around for review. And it's also gone through an approval stage in terms of the first approval stage, and now we're in the QA stage. So what I've been brought to now by clicking on that hyperlink is my login screen. And by putting in my credentials correctly, I'm able to log into the system. And notice how Vault will bring me directly to the document here. Keep in mind, what you saw me do there in the login screen and what you'll see me do throughout the presentation is all going to be done through my internet browser, zero footprint application, internet connection, internet browsers, all that I need. And so coming into here, I could actually you know, page through this and see this particular document that I'm about to approve. If I accept this task, you know, that in this case, this was assigned to a few people in QA. One of us can claim it, and I happen to do that right there. If I want to actually go through the finalization of this particular task, notice how it brings up the ability for me to do a Part 11 compliance signature with my username, my password, and my reason for my signature. If I enter in my credentials correctly, I will have applied the signature here. And keep in mind, and keep your eye on this part here, it's, it's talked about version 0.3. Version 0.3 is going to go to major version 0.1 because QA approval is done. And this will go to the issued state. The status will go from in approval to issue, issued. And if I hit on complete, notice how I will have completed this task. And the relevant items that I just mentioned were also done. Now it's interesting to note, if I ever want to see this outside of the system, if I have permission, I'm able to get a viewable rendition here. Notice how I was able to download that. And what's going to happen is, is curious in that if I open this up, we have the same document there that we saw on the screen inside of Vault. But now we've also placed things like this header information here. This is completely configurable. But you can see we put things like the, no, the document number, 
the name of the document, the version, what the status was. We splashed, splashed this across. It says a training copy. It could say anything. It's con configurable once again. And then notice on the bottom how it says, you know, this was retrieved by, put my name in there, and then put the date on here. I've also seen where people put in is good for only seven days after so that someone's not running around with this thing come August or September. Now, if I scroll down, we'll see the remainder of this document. And then in the final page here, what we've done actually is appended this signature page. And we can see the signature history here. And of course, these signatures are 21 CFR Part 11 compliant with a printed name, and date and time stamp, and the reason for the signature. And so notice, yeah, Adam Approver had looked at this previously. And also, we can see the Ken Quality, myself, I had just signed off on that. And so now, you know, this could be printed off, and we, at least we'd have some kind of controls around this in terms of the headers, footers, and watermarks on there. Just a level set, I'm back in Vault now. I closed out of that PDF. If you ever wanted to just see, you know, who had signed something in the past, you don't necessarily have to go through what I just did. There's a robust audit trail that's here that tells me more than I probably ever want to know about this document. But notice how it shows even who has viewed the document, what the property fields were before and now after they were changed for some reason, maybe through a system or through me consciously going in and changing properties. Notice how it shows my electronic signature here with the username, date and time stamp, and the reason for the signature. And if I scroll down, we'll even be, be able to see you know, the other signature history in here when Adam signed off. We can even see if someone wanted to check this in and check this out in the past. So the full um, audit trail is there at my fingertips if I would like to go in there and look at that. So if we think about what just happened here, you know, I'm at the issued state of the document. And before this, of course, I did QA approval. And of course, before that, this document was created, went through a review, and went through an approval. If you want to see how that took place, there's going to be there's a recording on our website that shows the April 8th presentation where a lot of that was covered. But now back to here, what I probably want to do at this stage is, you know, perhaps send this out for training. And if I click down on this gear uh, icon right here, notice how it gives me some various items that I can pick from. And these are permissible, you know, the ability to kick off workflows or perform some of the tasks that you see here. But for example, if I said, yeah, I'd like to start a read and understood, notice how it'll ask me, okay, who would you like to have trained on this? We could automate this based on property fields that are um, populated on the right-hand side there, or, you know, in this example, I'm manually doing it. Notice how I could pick a group, so I could say, yeah, alternate users. If you want to know who's in that group, you can hover over it and see it immediately. For the sake of brevity and just for today's example, I'm just going to send this to myself. And then notice how I could even put a due date on here. You know, maybe I pick the first of next month, for example. If I start this out, this has now been assigned to me. And as you would probably expect, much like you saw when I started off the presentation today, I would get an email notification on this. Of course, I could click on the link, and it would take me into my task. What I wanted to show you also was how I could have the ability to go via my home screen. And it's in my home screen where it's really the nerve center of what I have to do. Vault tells me what I have to do from the aspect of tasks that I have to perform or maybe things that are keeping me in the loop here around notifications. I'm going to go into the tasks here and on this read and understood. And sure enough, here it is. It was just assigned to me a few seconds ago. And if I dive into this particular item, notice how it brings me up this document. It's kind of scaled down. It doesn't have all the ancillary uh, metadata items on the side. But notice how I can sign for the read and understood here. Once again, per part 11, username, password, reason for my signature, and I will have uh, gone through and completed you know, this training task here. If I put in my credentials correctly and click on complete, now that task is out of my area there. So you know, once training has been completed on this at this stage, since we just created this in its first iteration, you know, here is where I could actually go out and say, yeah, I'd like to make this document effective, perhaps. And so if I click on Make Effective from the gear icon again, Notice how it'll say, OK, when would you like to set the periodic review date? Notice how it defaults to next year. That's just the configuration setting. We could set it to any time period that would make sense for your organization and the way that you work. But you know that's been set for one year out. And you'll see this issued state go to effective. And now that periodic review has been set. Now, you know, of course, if I dive into this again right here, reminders would be sent out saying that this periodic review is coming due soon and, and things like that. And clearly, we wouldn't want to wait around to next year. But just to show you what would happen, I could actually kickstart this periodic review and, of course, do some kind of assignment or even automate this. But you know, notice how if I say you know, a due date here of the end of the month for this, 
and I'm assigning this to myself, notice what happens in that when I accept this and I go through to perform this task for periodic review, how I have a decision to make after looking this over. You know, it, should I keep, can I keep this effective? Or does this need revision? Or does this need to be withdrawn? And all of these kick off a completely different workflow. So that's one of the powers here that we can have, you know, this decision tree and this nomenclature, and you could have additional steps or fewer steps. But, you know, if I just said, you know, to keep this effective in the periodic reviewer, notice how now I'll actually go out and have this next step come up where I need to actually set the next periodic review date, which of course is, you know, defaulted to what our standards were here. But you get the idea of the way that this would come out and I go through here and look at this and then have a decision to make, perhaps to withdraw this, perhaps to actually send this out for review and approval again and go through and revise this. Or if it's fine, I could just keep it there and move on. Now, next what I'd like to be able to do is actually go through and, you know, show you the way control copy would take place. You know, I, I, I demonstrated how we could take this out of the system uh, via that PDF and put watermarks around it. We can also do it with even a little bit more uh, stringent areas, you know, and that quality docs provide special rules and fields in addition to standard download functionality. And it really supports the generation, distribution, and tracking of control copies. And so here, let's, let's imagine that I wanted to send this to an external user. You know, maybe some guy like Bob External. And if I said, okay, what are the audience details, you know, for this particular uh, person, you know, maybe I say, well, you know, he's a consulting vendor. And, for example, the reason justification is um, that this is, I don't know, a legally binding, um, you know, procedure. As you can see, we can put in here whatever makes sense. If I say download a distribution copy, it's going to be very similar to before. It's going to bring down a PDF rendition of this. It's going to put various header and footer uh, information on my documents. And basically what's going to happen, and if I open this up, is that we're going to see this similar to before, but notice how there's a different watermark, for example. It says control copy. And then in the footer here, we'll begin to see some bigger differences. What's happened, for example, on one point here is that it's actually created its own unique document number for this. It's really appended uh, to the existing unique identifier to it and created that for me shows who this was for when it was requested. So this is a way that I could at least keep track of something that's going perhaps to an external user as we saw here. Now furthermore, what I can do now is I can actually report on this. And if I jump into my reports area, you can see I have a library of reports. But what I'd be able to look at is really, you know, control copy by recipient. This report here would be very useful to me in this case because what I could do is get an exact idea of what I sent out and the who and the when. And notice how here's the one that I just sent out. It shows its unique number when it was created just recently here. And then I can actually also see things like the distribution justification and the, you know, the audience details that I had typed in there. And if I click on this drop down, I can even take actions such as issue a recall that would notify the user or mark this as recall. So it's a way for me to at least communicate with who I sent this to and let them know especially if they're external, that, you know, this is no longer a valid copy, even though maybe it goes beyond what we would normally do if it was, uh, you know, if we said it's not valid after seven days, but maybe within that time frame we'd want to be able to recall that. So we'd have, you know, we can track who did that or where it went to and how it happened. I'm going to jump back to the library. I'm going to go to my calibration SOP that we've been working with. So far we've approved this as a QA person, we've sent this out for training, and then made it effective. I showed the way that you could do control copy here. And now what I'd like to, to go through is really the way that if the day came where I wanted to revise this and bring this to 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and eventually up, promote it to perhaps a major version like 2.0, how I would do that. If I have the permission to do that, I can actually go into here and open up a change control. Now notice what it does is it brings a change control form for me and presents it here. This is completely independent document-wise and record-wise in the system, but of course it's linked to what, where I just started. And the way that we work this really is that we take a gatekeeper approach, meaning what has to happen is that this form has to be pre-approved and then and only then am I allowed to then go make the changes on the document. So it's, once again, that kind of a gatekeeper approach. So if I say this is the calibration, you know, change control, 
And if I scroll down, you'll see we've leveraged some of the existing metadata properties, brought them into here. This is all configurable, but I could say, you know, to answer these, I want to do a change. It's major. Notice how some of these are in yellow and some are in white. The yellow fields are mandatory fields. I have to um, put in some sort of a value in order to save this. The white are optional. And of course, that's configurable in terms of which one's what. Notice how I filled in major areas like the reason, the summary. And then if I wanted to do, you know, is this part of a periodic review or is this just a, this just a one-off or something like that, I could select that. One item of interest could be this target of change that's here. Notice how it's linked to this. And this document is at this stage is still locked because this form has to be approved before this will unlock this and allow authorized individuals to go in and begin to revise this particular SOP that we've been working with. And so, you know, at this stage, if I'm happy with this, I could save this. Notice how Vault will now put this into the initiated state. And now with this form, I really need to work with this and say, okay, I'd like to perhaps send this around for review and approval, which is what typically would happen. Or I could say, you know what, I want to close this particular item. For some reason, we started this, but I don't want it anymore. Or we've allowed this for certain individuals with high-level rights to do an emergency change approval. We found some customers who said, you know, we have instances where this change needs to happen right now. I don't have time to go through the review and approval process. For the sake of brevity today, I'm going to select this just to uh, show you how you know, we can approve this quickly and then what happens and how the document's unlocked. I'm going to put in my credentials here. Notice that even with this emergency change that we notify folks specifically here in QA, but you could put whoever into here so that people even know that this maybe unusual event took place. If I start this off, we'll notice that it's going to go from initiated to approved. And then what's nice is this. Back to this target of change, which we saw locked before, that will be unlocked. It's at version 1.1 now. It's in the draft stage. And you know, if I open up this target of change in a new tab, Notice how it'll open the tab for me, and I'll be you know, back in this document that we uh, had here that was just effective and is still effective to consumers, but for super users like us, we can see you know, what's going on here and that this is in the draft state. If I jump over to this particular view, now I could actually begin to go and author changes in draft, send this out for review, really all the things that perhaps you would have seen in the April 8th presentation around accelerating the quality process. And so what's nice is this is really the same exact workflows that we used even when the document was going from creation in point one, point two, and so on and so forth. And thus we're not reinventing the wheel and re reinventing these workflows, but ra rather leveraging validated workflows in the same area. And thus, you know, if we ever made a change to our review process or approval process, we wouldn't have to change it in multiple places. Now, if you wanted to have a different review process here than what, what you do with your documents from when they're first, very first created for the first time, yeah, you could do that. But keep in mind that we can leverage items that are out there that have been proven to work and that uh, you know, work, work nice. And so as you can see, we've kind of come full circle here uh, with even with the last presentation where this was, it was created from scratch, went out for review, was approved uh, in its first stage. Then today we did the QA approval, sent it out for training and made it effective. And now we're back at the beginning again in terms of a draft stage, albeit at a 1.1 now. And we go through the same process once again that, uh, that it went through to, to get to this in the first place. And with that, I'm going to jump over to this stage and hand it over to Amy for any questions, uh, perhaps, and I'll have some answers. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. So I just wanted to remind everybody, if you have a question, uh, you can please feel free to type that in the GoToWebinar panel. But you know what, let's start off with this one. So Jeff, someone is asking, uh, does any kind of report exist for the training or the read and understood tasks that you were showing? Report, oh, okay, yeah, so let me go back out of here and back into Vault. You know, if I went under the reporting library where I showed the way that I could um, you know, see the controlled uh, copy report that I showed. It's also in here. In fact, it's right here. If I wanted to see, you know, read and understood around compliance against all documents, this is one way, for example, that we could see this. So if I open this up, notice how it will present me with my users. And I can see if they're adhering to training or not. So let's pick on this first guy here, Adam Approver. Let's look. If I open this up, 
we can see the documents, the document number, the versions, where they're at and their statuses and things like that. And then notice here the status of his training. He's incomplete on these top two. He completed this one. He didn't do this one. So there's three out of six that he's incomplete on in this example. Obviously, this is a demo environment. But just to give you an idea of the way that I could quickly zero in on, some, on someone or even a particular document and look at this, of course, we could slice and dice this data a little bit differently and, and, and even look at it from a document aspect rather than a user perspective like we are here. And then one item I'd like to point out while I'm in the reporting uh, area, if I click on Edit, to create this re report, you know, I don't expect it, everyone to understand exactly this, but I'd like to, them to come away with one major point, is that, in that we, no one's dusting off a Java book or a C-sharp book and trying to write reports. It's all point and click, and you're just picking property fields and really uh, populating the, them here. And so it's a very nice feature. And it's actually built into the application, so there's no add-ins, no plugins even with that. Internet connection, internet browser, you're able to run reports, so I could have run a report on any uh, device and browser as well. Any other questions? Great. Um, actually, there is one more, Jeff. Uh, so someone is asking that if or really when changes come to any FDA regulations, how will Viva address that? Yeah, so I mean, obviously it would depend on what they're referring to specifically, but, you know, let's take an example, maybe something like, you know, 21 CFR Part 11 around Part 11 compliant signatures and electronic records and things like that, you know, because I touched upon that today. Um, you know, we come out with three releases uh, a year. Uh, the new functionality, of course, is in the turned off position and organizations have to accept, you know, on their own if they want to go ahead with something, which, which is nice because it doesn't, you know, upheave their validation processes and things like that. But with that said, you know, what's determined to go, go into that? There's a lot of thought amongst our product development team and product management team of, of what would happen there. But what they generally look at are things like, you know, recommendations from customers, things that we're hearing in industry. And they weigh those and go through and decide what would go into the next release. But one thing that can supersede even all of that that I just mentioned is something that affects you know, compliance and regulatory areas, and specifically in this example, something around, you know, maybe the way that the electronic records and um, Part 11 compliance signatures takes place. And so that would really take precedence, and we would put that at the top of our list and address that because of the fact that Vault is built specifically for the life sciences industry. And if, you know, regulation like that exists, then we definitely need to give it the utmost attention and, uh, and bring that um, type of compliance uh, to our customers. Indeed, that sounds really great. Um, so perfect, that's, that's all the questions that I think we have for today. Uh, if we didn't actually get to your question, because I do see a couple in the queue, uh, then we will follow up with you after this webinar. Uh, but just a reminder to head on over to our website, and you can sign up for our next demo in our series. It's called Extending Quality Processes to Your Global Workforce. And that's going to be held on Thursday, May 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time. So thank you, everyone, for joining, and thank you, Jeff. We look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Bye-bye now. Thank you, everyone.